So good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our weekly webinar, The Lowdown in the Lockdown. Uh, this is our weekly Leo Prop Crowd um, webinar, which is designed really just to stay in touch uh, with people in the uh, property community and uh, those who are involved, particularly in crowdfunding, but it's not just specific to crowdfunding. So we've got a, a brilliant guest uh, that we'll be talking to in a few moments' time. Uh, I'm just waiting for John Corey to arrive. He should arrive um, any second. Um, if anyone has any issues with sound or with um, the picture screen, you should be seeing a, a copy of the slides for today. If you just drop something into the, the Q&A um, section, uh, just to confirm that you're hearing me okay, the sound is good, and that the uh, pictures are grand. So that would be helpful if you can do that for me, please. And uh, during these um, webinars, we don't actually use the uh, chat box, really. Uh, although, again, thank you for those who have confirmed, um, which, is, which is great. And uh, when it comes to Q&A, we do want people to um, get involved by way of giving your opinion. Um, I can see from the attendees, we've got people who are property professionals in their own right. So please make comments in the Q&A section. We'll happily involve those where they're relevant to the the discussion at that time um, and also then when it comes to um, well, anything we talk about or anything that uh, Dan is talking about if you have a particular question then feel free fire it into the Q&A and we'll be able then to um, answer it the best we can um, or it's something that perhaps Dan can follow up with uh, if it needs more more detail so I'm just checking uh, John is Okay, he's having difficulties logging in. Um, so we're gonna have to just get on with it. Um, what I will do is actually just, I'll just pause for 30 seconds here and, and, get, and get John in. So just let me uh, go on camera for 30 seconds, guys. You can grab a cup of tea or something like that and then we'll, then we'll get started in a wee second. So there we are back again. Hopefully that's going to be John sorted in a, in a second. Uh, seems to be a bit of a Zoom, Zoom issue of two meetings going at once, um, but, but there you go. So um, hopefully John will join in a, in a second or two. Um, I'll just keep an eye out on the panelists as well in case he may just come in as a participant and then we can uh, move him over uh, in due course. Don't see him on yet. So, okay, so let me just uh, kick off and then we'll, we'll get John involved um, as soon as he arrives in. So. Uh, these events, uh, weekly webinars, are really just to stay in touch with people. Uh, we've got um, myself as MD of Leo uh, Prop Crowd, property crowdfunding company, and then we have uh, Mr. John Corey, who is from Property Fortress, and uh, he runs a monthly networking property event, probably one of the oldest in London. And uh, we literally put these on uh, just so that we can touch base with people and. Uh, we can just update people as we go along. So I think that's John joining us now. So is that you in now, John? Yep. I did. I did. Hey, welcome, welcome, welcome. The, the joys of technology, eh? Yeah, especially me, who should be able to do this. <laughs> no, you're right. No problem at all. So um, yeah, let me just kicking off the first slide here. So this is the agenda, guys. We just run down 
property market update, a little bit about working from home productively, um, and then we'll be straight into our special guest. So without any further ado, let's just get, get on with this. Uh, always like to give a shout out to our uh, heroes in the National Health Service. Um, it is a little bit strange that we sort of continue to talk about business and making money and opportunities, um, but we are conscious that some people have perhaps uh, lost loved ones uh, through this virus or even just through normal circumstances. Um, and also many people are affected either by having family members involved in the National Health Service. So we always like just to sort of pause and give a shout out um, to those involved. And uh, obviously we do recognize the sacrifice that they're um, doing and giving up uh, to kind of let us get on with our, with our businesses. So that's just a shout out. So in terms of the current market, um, I've certainly got a couple of comments, John, um, by way of update, but what's your sense and sort of ear to the ground in London? What's the jungle drums saying about the property market in the UK? So on one hand, the property market's fine. On another anecdotal evidence, a guy buying an auction, uh, I think this week or last week, is saying he would feel that it's a 20% drop. Uh, whether that's because the auctioneers are still trying to figure out how to run an auction and the energy in a room is different than an energy online. Um, there's a couple of people I've talked to where they are scrambling. I know a person has a rather interesting development when it comes to the numbers and because their equity backer wobbled and the lender wobbled, they now have to dump their project. Um, they're happy to get out at cost. It's a decent sized development. So you could argue that there's turbulence. The problem is how much of this filters through to the land registry. The land registry essentially is a lagging indicator. A valuer is gonna look at the last three months of sales. Well, pretty soon we won't even have three months. We'll have mm. two months, we'll have one month. Um, and so some of that won't ripple through yet. Mm -hmm. um, but yet to be blunt, most of the population is still alive. So most people still need houses. We don't need office buildings right now, but we need houses. So it's way, way, way too early to say what the quote impact to the market is. I think it's down to the individual deals and you may find there are some opportunities. Uh, I believe our, our speaker later, Dan, will talk about an opportunity he's looking at now that's come back around partially because of maybe the turbulence or just some other person get cold feet or something. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very much so. Um, in, in terms of the recent changes I've detected in the conversations this week with developers within the um, property crowdfunding space, obviously talking to people on a regular basis, I think I've certainly detected a much more upbeat and optimistic frame of mind this week than certainly has been in previous weeks. Now, I don't want to obviously get a, ahead of ourselves, uh, in terms of uh, are we coming out of the sort of the current nightmare? But um, certainly, as I understand that some of the large um, house builders in the UK have indicated they're going to go back um, to sites by the end of next week. Uh, I believe Taylor Wimpy have, have indicated that. I don't know if you've had, had that verified or if you know anyone you've heard say the same thing, but I've certainly received information along those lines. And um, also, I think lots of discussions between the government and house builders regarding valuations as you just say there about how do you you know compare sales in, in the area if there hasn't been any in the last two or three months so as i understand it again there are conversations happening to try and avoid sort of an uh, sort of well let's say an over devaluation if that's the right terminology to use so that we don't get this massive crash of prices which you know forces people to to do things they would normally have done in ordinary circumstances so um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if that plays out and how much that impacts going back to normality quite quickly. Yeah, and see, this is a funny one. So the government doesn't have a vote. There's nothing they can do. Um, valuers, we're all into charts of areas. They set the ground rules for what evaluation is. And if there's no data, there's no data. And the government could say, well, I want you to pretend that there is data. That's like saying, let's pretend the virus isn't killing anyone and we'll just all go back to work. Well, no, we're going to depend on the science. If we're going to depend on the science, we're going to have to look at the data. And lenders also can't just magically decide to approve loans when there's no evidence that 
this loan makes sense if we don't know what the value is. So. Mm. Yeah, no, it'll be interesting to see how that how that pans out, and um, I'm sure Dan will have a, a comment on that in terms of uh, when it comes uh, to his so his a, a really sort of odd comment, real quick, is if Taylor Wimpy or others send the workers back, they're still going to have to address social distancing, and they don't get mm -hmm. the excuse, "Oh, we're construction workers; we work close." No, they're going to have to space it out. That will impact how quickly they can do certain things. That'll stop them from being able to do things because. Mm -hmm at some level it's not up to the government to say we're going to kill off Taylor wimpy workers by sending them into unsafe situations the you know health and safety still applies yeah and then if you flip it to the airline someone said well if they take out the middle row of seats so that people sit far enough apart that's great except it kills the economics so another idea is we'll just turn around the whole middle row and that whole middle row face backwards and we'll put up uh, perspex glass or something in between well do we have to then crash test those planes and evacuate those planes with these plastic barriers and everybody facing backwards and such. So yeah. are the planes able to be certified if they did that? So. Yeah, so there are complications. Yeah, well, so certainly, as I say, hopefully we are um, you know, looking at the light at the end of the tunnel. And I say certainly the feedback I've had, I was talking to one developer for what it's worth this week who is um, looking to build actually some apartments um, due to start September, October, 12 month build. And the senior debt lender has indicated uh, that they will um, sort of give a GDV on the project um, based on prices as they were expected to be before the virus. So their logic was that they reckon from 12 months from now, that will be back to a degree of normality. And the prices that sort of were there pre-virus is probably what the house prices will be in 12 months from now. So that was interesting from a from a senior lender, you know. So, um, main challenges before we move on. Any any main challenges that you see over the next week or two? I suppose you've really just got covered those. It's going to be so. So the main challenges is that. Well, the main challenges is that we don't know. Um, there was a medical authority speaking, and it'll be one to two years before there's a vac a vaccine. And if that's true, that's fine. Um, but that also means that based on current antibody testing, as much as they could even understand it, we're only at 5 to 10% of the population actually has antibodies that we think might work. We don't know if they do. That yeah. means most of the population is still exposed. That means we're going to have multiple lockdowns for the next year or two. If we're going to have multiple lockdowns for the next year or two, we're not going back to normal in three weeks. We're just mm. going to get ready for the next wave. Interesting, yeah. And, and I suppose with all that comes... This big word opportunities. Um, I, I was yes. I, I was I was interested because it was on a webinar. I think I started this week. I think it was, and the person refused to use the word opportunities. They just felt it was a little bit distasteful, uh, understandably so, in the current environment with people losing their lives. So he had this big phrase of unintended economic consequences. Um, why that differs from opportunities, I suppose, is something that you can you can you can argue back and forward. But still, the point being, you know, the what has happened, the changes, the challenges, all those things um, simply lead to, to opportunities for some people um, if their model allows them to, allows them to do that. Yeah. Yes, and I think that's the point is you adjust your model so you can take advantage in a way that is not dependent on everything going back to normal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, so I always like to do just one um, brief slide on working from home. And uh, I personally have worked from home for sort of 23 years, so there isn't huge upheaval in my um, work routine. But as I talk to people, I've been amazed by the amount of people have said to me they've really struggled or found it a lot more difficult than they thought working from home. So I thought today just briefly three sort of tips, three don't do's. Um, one, do not become demotivated. And uh, I'm sure most people on the call are entrepreneurial. They like to think they're self-motivated, self-starters. Um, but there is, and again, you read articles and listen to people um, chatting online. Uh, people are beginning to find after four or five weeks of this sort of goldfish bowl mentality. Uh, it's Groundhog Day. Um, that motivation um, you know, can take a bit of a dip. You know, so obviously watch, watch out for that. Get your exercise. Get your change of scenery the best you can in your circumstances. Uh, don't stay alone too long. Uh, again, it sounds so simplistic, but again, a lot of people are talking about this, how 
they're sitting so long in the same office staring at a computer screen and uh, after a while it, it again just becomes very very monotonous um, so I think it is important uh, to to you know if you have other people in the house go and spend 20 minutes with them if you go and take your daily exercise with them so you're not alone during that um, and just don't get caught on this sort of endless treadmill of 24 7 on your own and the last one for me is don't binge eat um, and that's probably more for me than anybody I don't know if anyone else is experiencing this but I've definitely put on weight in the last four weeks uh, I still do my runs still do plenty of fitness but um, it's just so tempting you know one of the sons or, or my wife throws on the kettle and you get a shout the kettle's on so you take a cup of tea then a couple of biscuits etc etc and before you know it um, you know you're, you're eating too much so yeah, um, just throwing it out there. Uh, it mightn't affect everyone, but certainly it's something I'm having to I'm having to watch. So there are just a few a few tips to working working from home. So okay, so I, I, I do find it funny that you think every time there's a cup of tea, there has to be sugar laden biscuits. It it must be a Northern Ireland thing, John. I don't know, but um, a drink is definitely much too wet if you don't have a biscuit with it, uh, and the biscuit is much too dry if you don't have a cup of tea with it. So that's 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 what I find. Then switch to water, I guess. <laughs> There's no taste off water. Um, so there we are. Yeah, that's okay. Um, right. So let's move ourselves on here now. Um, so delighted today that we've got a special guest on. I want to give him plenty of time. And uh, today we're focusing on the commercial sector. So we're obviously a property crowdfunding site. Um, John and his business does property in general. Um, but we, we are like, like to cover different aspects of the property market. We've never done commercial before. It's not something even our platform has really been in, involved in, although myself and Dan have had numerous conversations and, and um, something may come from that the next couple of weeks, so you can keep an eye out for that. But um, just to introduce Dan, he can unmute himself and take his camera off um, if he's able to do that now. But we've got um, Dan has completed over 36 uh, commercial transactions. Uh, certainly with a value over tens of millions. So he's been in loads of press um, up in Scotland and indeed property magazines and things like that. Um, he has this quote, which I absolutely love, deals, learning and sharing are my oxygen. So that, that's what he describes himself as. Uh, there's his site. If anyone wants to take a snap of that and you can go on his site, find out more about him, find out more about what he does, some of the deals he does, um, as well as doing deals. He also does a bit of training and mentoring, which he can uh, look at from there. But uh, I'm literally going to introduce him, let him say hello. Um, he's got three questions that he's going to answer on the screen. Um, and then John's really going to do like a Q&A um, with Dan because what we want to cover a lot of material. Um, so rather than deep diving into one section, um, we think we want to try and cover loads. But again, if you have any questions, fire it in the Q&A and, and, and Dan will be more than happy to um, answer that question for you. If you've got a point on commercial, stick it in the Q&A for us. So, Dan, welcome. I'll hand over to you for your sort of three-point introduction and then let John uh, take it from there. Well, thanks very much. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, uh, David and John, uh, for inviting me on here. It's always a pleasure to jump on and chew the fat on, you know, deals, commercial. I kind of love it. It's, uh, it lights me up. And uh, there's nothing more lights me up than helping someone who's come from, you know, a different point of view, residential, whatever, and help them get their first commercial deal. It's quite exciting. It's uh, uplifting. But anyway, um, in terms of going back to questions, because I always go off track, you've got to keep me on track. Who is Dan Taylor? Um, <laughs> Dan Taylor is, uh, I'm, I'm just a normal guy like you, um, from Scotland, spend more time between here and Marbear, when we can get back there. Um, it's my view that every, anyone that lives in Scotland should have a free place in Spain to live, to get some vitamin D around them. Um, but I, I enjoy myself over there. I've been in commercial for quite some time, come from a business buying background. Uh, first transaction was in 1995, that's a bit scary. And um, on that transaction, we did okay. Uh, and we'll tell you about that a little bit later. So really, um, you know, family-based business from Scotland. We love commercial, we love buying businesses, and uh, we love sharing that information and helping other people do the same. So why commercial cool. property? Yep, is that cool? Yeah, so why commercial? Yeah, that's good. Why commercial property um, from my point of view? Well, um, in residential, you, have, you may have blinkers on. Uh, 
and it basically restricts you from doing a number of different things. Still, if you're in the asset class of residential, it is ridiculously cool. And why is that? Because it's property. And property is probably the easiest uh, platform, the easiest strategy, business model to acquire income for the everyday man in the street like myself. Um, why commercial? Where there are certain advantages in commercial over residential. We have a, a video on the YouTube channel that goes into a little bit more detail, about 20 minutes, uh, called Assets, A W S E T Z, on the YouTube channel, Dan Taylor, if you want to go and have a look at that at some point. But really, in a nutshell, uh, in commercial, you don't have the negatives of residential. For example, the landlord tax fashion. In uh, commercial, we have the opposite of that. Short term leases in residential, we have the opposite of that. Um, something called in commercial, full repairing insuring leases. Uh, in residential, you have the opposite of that. So in residential, you have the, all the obligations, the compliance, the regulations, and therefore your margin uh, from what you bring in from rental is usually about 70% to let then obviously pay for cost of capital. In commercial, you have, uh, you have something that I like to call gross equals net, uh, which basically means your rental coming in uh, stays in. Uh, with the cost of capital coming off thereafter. And the reason for that is all the repairs, the obligations, the compliance, the regulation, the costs, the management fees are all bundled up in that FRI and passed back to the tenants. Now, on top of that, you can even charge them on top of the rent to manage the property. Um, I like to outsource that, but that's a massive reason kind of why, you know, why commercial. Another reason why commercial is um, the hassle. In residential, it's very hands-on. In commercial, just to give you a real-life example, why commercial? Why le less? No, 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 no. Real life. No, no, no. Just give <laughs> us a theory. We'll do the real life and the example. <laughs> no, this is a different one. It's a two. It's a one-minute snippet. It's a property I rented out in June 2013, John. It's up in Scotland in Perth near Glen Eagles, which I, I kind of love. So, despite loving Glen Eagles, despite having a property there. I've never been back to that property, nor been involved in it since June 2013. Now that's kind of nearly seven years ago now. So that kind of, kind of you know, less hassle uh, definitely ticks the box. Um, and it's more akin to, you know, nearly passive income. It's not fully passive because nothing ever is. Um, but it's pretty much there all the way. Um, explosive growth. Why, we're still on Y commercial. Explosive growth. In commercial, you can double and triple the value of uh, properties, of values. In fact, one of our recent ones that we're buying, uh, we're completing on next week, is, um, is a 10X in value. You know, so we've increased the value by 10 times. And uh, we may come back on and maybe share that case study at some point. It's quite a cool one. I call it the art of development without development, or my public-private partnership kind of model. And it's all geared around de-risking. Because for me, the ability to massively increase values the key thing about that is the de-risking it brings, not the increase in value to re-gear. So for me, the whole thing is about de-risking, cash flow, less hassle. Um, and that's why kind of commercial for me, plus there's massive tax breaks, plus you can use your pension, um, plus you can get investors easier if you have the right kind of tenants in the right sectors, so they're de-risked and you can offer them to kind of tax-free returns, but in a very safe environment. And, um, and part of that accelerating values is the fact that you can do it without risky construction, risky conversions, and risky new build developments. Yeah? So you can do it in what I call coffees and chats instead of construction and contracts. I'll get into that when we hit a case study. But that's kind of why commercial in a nutshell. Um, and the effect of COVID-19 on the Scottish property market, well, um, you know, Scotland's no different to anywhere else. Uh, across the globe and it's obviously been devastating uh, on humanity and on macroeconomic climate in general um, but in terms of you know and then we all know that we all know the devastating effects that's happened but what are the positive effects because uh, I always like to either provide creative solutions to problems or look on the positive side of things a silver lining and think you know what is good about this situation the great thing that's happened that's come out of this situation is the, the powers that be in the legal firms in Scotland plus the Land Registry of Scotland have, co you know, have collaborated together 
and accelerated um, the innovation in Scotland of the end-to-end -end digitization of real estate transactions. Now that's not been, it's never happened before and because of the coronavirus, that's triggered the crystallization of this and it's happened at such a rapid pace and in two weeks time, we have the land registry will finally be open in Scotland, happy days, for acceptance of digital registrations. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, I suppose fortunately, very fortunately actually, uh, the NHS key workers will be number one with residential, number two will be normal residential that aren't key workers, and num number three will be commercial. So one of the great things that's happened out of this, I mean, not a lot great that's happened out of this is the fact that, yes, we've all had this wake up call, uh, we all realize, number one, we need to survive in order to thrive. And survival right now is, um, you know, protecting cash balances, um, reducing outgoings, increasing in income for whatever reason. Um, but, the, you know, the, the absolute amazing thing is this acceleration of innovation that's happening, not just in the land registry, but everywhere. Okay, you know? very good. So this next slide, some of these points you've already touched on. Uh, you did mention pensions. That could be SIP, SAS, it could be normal pensions. Commercial property is rather unique compared to residential. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, with residential, you cannot, if you have a, a business pension, SIP or a SAS or whatever, um, you, you're not allowed to invest in residential directly. You can invest indirectly through a REIT or something or some other structure, but you have to be incredibly careful what you do because the regulation state you're not allowed to invest in residential. So the, the closer you go to the wire, the more exposed you are of crystallizing a massive tax loss. And for me, protection of capital is number one. So why would you do that in the first place? Yeah, so right. commercial, you're, they designed the business pensions to invest in commercial and other asset classes, but not residential. So why, why even go near to flouting the law? Why don't you just invest in commercial? Because it's a great, Asset class is a great strategy, but not all commercial is good. As right, yeah, it's it's not a assumption that commercial is good because you can use a pension, but it allows you to use your pension if there's a good commercial deal. So yeah, absolutely. And um, you know, for for me going forward, commercial, like shall we say, the right commercial, backed by mm -hmm. uh, SaaS business pensions investing uh, and crowdfunding to do it legally. Uh, that is it's the three ways why I see a real massive opportunity where you can take the power of the crowd, uh, the power of SaaS business pensions, uh, the passive business pensions, because you get obviously people with SaaSes that some are active, some are passive. Um, but if you have a passive uh, SaaS investor in your commercial property and you're going after the right tenant and the right sector that's hedged against the attack by the big cat, which is correction, Amazon and technology, that maybe that should be C squared now. Um, you know, if, as long as the right sector, the, the, the right tenant hedged against those kind of concerns right. and things, you're pretty safe. And most importantly, if it's your pension, your mess, you know, that you're investing at risk, exposed, then you want to decrease the exposure as much as possible because it's somebody's pension. And to do that, uh, I like to increase value by uh, really simple mechanisms, by asset management, by re-gearing of leases. Um, in fact, uh, you know, it's quite easier to tell you in a very simple story. A really simple- right, Actually, so the example that you have coming up, I think addresses points one and two, is that correct? Yes, but there's, a, there's something- okay. like But, but I, I do wanna make sure that, I, I was really impressed when we talked earlier about this bonus points, which is the, uh, one of the people in your network that you are working with. Yes. Um, so we could either work it in here or, or somewhere else, but I want to make sure we cover that. Yeah, well, that's where we should cover it now because it's very much in adding value, but adding value by in a very simple way with what I call coffees and chats instead of construction and contracts. Now, construction and contracts could be um, anything from an office to residential conversion. It could be a new build. And they're, you know, they're usually about a year to two years in length, typically 18 months. And they usually have a projected GDV, projected uh, finance costs uh, and construction costs. But you don't know what that's gonna be till you're down the road. Um, you know, the, the corona, if anything, highlights the kind of risks involved in there when you're projecting so far ahead. Um, 
So what I kind of prefer to do, I still get involved in developments, but what I prefer to do is really simple value adds. And uh, it came up last week in our club. We have a, we run a club where we have weekly uh, Zooms where we do, you know, do deep dive deals uh, on analysis and we, uh, we help other members of the club, you know, make the best of the asset, how to force appreciation to cash flow. And this, uh, this chat came up and he said, he just bought this as his first commercial with his SaaS, so very, a, a great way to buy things. And uh, he said, Dan, we've got a problem. Uh, the tenants don't want to pay just now. And uh, I said, so how much are we talking about? He says, well, it's 500 pound a month per, um, per tenant. He's got four tenants. Uh, and he said, they don't want to pay for two months. And I said, well, you know, you have to get back to them very proactively and help them out of the situation. And not only help them out of the situation, how can we turn this into a massive win for both them and yourself? So you're looking at two months, four tenants, that's about in the region of £4,000 arrears. And the tenants want a waiver, not a deferral. You know, so a waiver is completely different than a deferral. A waiver, just like it says, you're waving goodbye to the money. A deferral is an agreement to agree uh, to repayment of the arrears going forward. And I asked him, I said, how's your cash flow? Um, he said, it's fine, we're sitting on cash pile and the cash flow is fine uh, because he bought it with his pension. He's got plenty of reserves. I said, so if, if cash is not a concern, now if cash is a concern, different strategy, but cash wasn't a concern here. So I said, well, would you like to turn the 4,000 pounds into 40,000 pounds gain? So 4,000 in arrears into 40,000 pounds gain while you help the tenant out at the same time. He said, I like the sound of that. How do we do that? I said, you won't believe how simple it is. And it's really from a point of view of serving, coming from a point of view of being a servant of someone else's problems, providing a creative solution to their problem. And the type of tenants we're talking about is an accountant, a barber's, a hairdresser's, and a specialist cake shop, all been in business for over 15 years, and uh, they want to stay there, but they've got this slight cash flow problem. So I said, why don't you go to them and ask them, would you like to have a waiver of the full 4,000 pounds? So it's 1,000 pounds per tenant, full 4,000 um, pounds. And obviously they're going to say yes. And, uh, um, and you know, for doing that, quid pro quo for doing that, uh, we'll just increase the rent by 20 pounds a week. Now, 20 pounds a week for a small trader like that, a service-based business, doesn't sound a lot of money. But 20 pounds a week over a year is 1,000 pounds. Times four tenants is 4,000 pounds. And even at a very simple conservative yield of 10%, that is worth 40,000 pounds. So in a nutshell, that's how you can turn the, the real negative situation, the cash flow pressures on small businesses, small service-based businesses, and turn a 4,000 pound arrears into a 40,000 pound gain while at the same time simultaneously, you know, helping people out. And it's a way- I think that's a great, yeah, that's a great story. It's particularly relevant in this COVID period. Uh, it, it's an amazing transformation and it is very true that commercial, and I know you're gonna explain it in this next example, it's all about capitalizing the, the income, the yield, and that's essentially what you just described for those that aren't aware of this. I do find this next example also slightly funny, Dan, I know you picked it, but it's actually, you've you probably had to get your hands dirty in this one because this looks a little like a building project. I took a peek at the photos. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, despite that, you, would you believe, we'll go through this, and this is coffees and chats as well, as opposed to construction contracts, but 2.3 million was spent on the refurbishment of this property. So how did I manage to spend 2.3 million on this property after buying it um, and not get involved in the development? because that's kind of one of my creative strategies that I love. How can I identify the risks, not only mitigate, but transfer those risks to somebody else? And uh, what we did was um, we bought, as we love to buy from an administration, um, you know, banks already taken the asset back and they want to sell it on. And uh, <clears throat> what we bought was a 10 pin bowling alley. Now it had a, 10 -pin, a real 10 pin bowling alley running in business, making profits. And when we bought this, we, you know, at the time I thought I probably overpaid, but I, I kind of have an idea what I'm going to do with it. So I kind of um, overpaid at 1.25 million. And um, at the time, the profits were, I can't quite remember, we bought it at a rough seven times multiple. 
Now, this is really critical here, this, this what I'm about to say. We bought it as an operating profit multiple, which what businesses are based on, how they're sold, how they're valued. And we wanted to do one thing, and one thing only with this property, and it's turn it from how it was valued. Because if you're valuing on a multiple of profits, and you can turn that into an investment value, that changes everything. And it kind of doubled the value here. So on the left-hand side, you see the Tempe Bowling, the, the lanes, the, the bar restaurant in the front. It's a, it's a great location overlooking the water. And there's a game center in here as well. In fact, is there, I think there's a picture of the games. Maybe, maybe not, actually. No, there's not. Um, yeah, so, um, and then what we want to do is turn into uh, the picture on the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side, we have the spaces split up into uh, four units. There's actually five tenants, but four units. Uh, and we'll find out about the fifth tenant very soon. So, and, and again, what we're doing is going from a trading business that are bought and sold on a multiple of profits and turning that into an investment that are sold on a yield basis. Yeah, and that's really the one thing, just bear that in mind. But yes, as John said, there were a lot of, <laughs> a lot of construction here. And in fact, uh, 2.3 million was spent on this property by a multitude of different contractors. Um, but in, in terms of what I spent, um, I, you know, if you imagine we've got four, five big massive billion pound companies, uh, from JD Weatherspoons uh, to Co-op Food to um, Costa Coffee, National and Game Center, and then a, a kind of government quango. Now the uh, Weatherspoons at the time, they're opening up 48 sites a year. Co-op were opening about the same, and Costa were opening about 110. They were an, an absolute rampage, opening 110 units a year at the time. So if you imagine, you've got a trading unit, you've got employees, um, you, you've actually got a business that's running on a, a weekly basis, and then you're going from turning into this into an investment and you've got all these trades to worry about this you know the utilities the as uh, you know demolition the rebuilding of the walls to split the units different water coming in waste coming in electric coming in and that's a lot of work and it's 2.3 million spend but in commercial if you structure the deal correctly you don't spend any of that because the tenants spend it but in commercial, there's usually a part of the mix that are called landlord's works, and they're utilities and splitting the unit. Um, now, I factored all that up, and the last thing I wanted to do was get involved in that because I had these massive billion pound companies that have a pipeline of units to open, and if you don't deliver the unit in the right spec on the right day, they'll have you in court quicker than you can imagine. And, and the, you can imagine the fees that they will charge you um, so I didn't want to get involved in that. I wanted to mitigate and transfer that risk. So we agreed a deal with each of the national companies that transferred that whole risk back to them. They were quite happy because it brings it under their control. And when you're trying to own that many units, you, need, you know, they love that kind of control. And we just did a quid pro quo on the value of those landlord works, transferred it with a rent buildup. And that's how we mitigated the risk there and didn't get involved in any of the development that you see there. And what we turned it into was... Um, there's a Weatherspoons, which is a big bar restaurant chain. I think we've got 993 units. Uh, Costa Coffee, uh, Co-op Food, and uh, a national game center that trades as Showboat Amusements. Um, the interesting thing about Showboat Amusements, actually, John, um, is really it's quite, you know, th this really is a foundation of commercial if you get it right. Showboat Amusements opened up, they traded for two years, and then they stopped trading from the unit. So last year or something, they stopped trading or the year before. And, um, but guess what? They still have to pay rent for the next 13 years because we picked the right tenant with the right strength uh, that's gonna be here for the long term. And they still have liabilities for the rates. They still have liabilities for the alarm system. They still have liabilities to make sure everything's clean and tidy. Um, so despite them closing down and have left the building, they still have complete um, onerous obligations for the term of the lease because it's a contract. Yeah. Now, cool. Yeah. So um, that's quite interesting. Um, the other interesting thing is the fifth tenant is actually a, a government quango. It's the uh, Calmac asset owning division of the ferry operator. And they're on the beach and they have 8,000 square feet of pebbles on the beach that we talked them into a 35 year lease without any, um, any breaks whatsoever. 
Uh, it's only 10K a year. Um, but the key thing for me is it, it was a bit of a pain. You know, it's like hassle, this beach, because twice a year we had to, you know, get some laborers to clean it out because the, the weeds came up, grew up really quick in May and June. And that cost me about a thousand pounds a year, but it was just really the hassle more than a thousand pounds a year. And so we managed to transfer all that hassle and that cost and secure them on a 35 year lease with no breaks. Um, and it's pretty, I don't know, that's one of our most exciting deals, even though it's not the biggest one, the beach. <laughs> and there's no building on it. It's just it's literally a beach. So um, in here, that remember, you know, this is more of a kind of buying business stroke, creative commercial fusion, if you like, this kind of transaction. And I really relish, uh, what I love best is coming up with great strategies uh, that combine business buying, m and techniques, creative commercial techniques, um, with a view of really forcing appreciation to de-risk the whole project. That's what I love best. And um, this one, remember, we're going from OP, operating profit, to investment value. We've got five, five uh, tenants, uh, and the leases combined are 15 to 35 years. Uh, and the numbers on this, as you see, we, we, um, we, it cost us 1.25 million, and uh, the value today is 3.5 million. Interestingly, uh, we got an offer last year at 4.25 by one of the tenants, uh, but things have changed, you know? So, um, but the thing is, this is not just a, a value, this is an income play. You know, this is secure income for the very, very long term. So whether I sell it yesterday, today, or tomorrow, um, you know, it's, it's all based on the, the, the guarantee of the safety of that income going forward. And uh, okay. you know, I've got no intention of selling. And um, you know, so how- well, so what, I, what I find interesting is, you know, the numbers are here and, on your second line, you have four HSB, so you know high street businesses plus the government quango, the ferry, and the logos across the bottom represent your tenants, and it's quite attractive if you are raising money or if you are sort of promoting your business and what you've done to, to have these as these are your tenants. I mean, these are brands that people would recognize. So, other what other takeaway point? Given we have a couple of minutes left, but we're almost uh, need to wrap up in this section. What other takeaway points should people get from Taylor Capital and, and your story? Well, I believe in the, the law of least effort and least moving parts. Um, and I believe- Does that, does that mean you're lazy? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Good man, I like this. This is, now we're talking the same language. <laughs> yes, why, why uh, but what did Bruce Lee said? Bruce Lee said something like, be wary of the quiet man in the corner. Um, as opposed to the loud man um, or something like that. But basically he meant, um, and he said, you know, be water, my friend. So you can put water in a cup, it changes its form. So I'm a very fluid kind of person. And I'm a very creative kind of person. Um, and I love to look at things. How do we de-risk? How do we add massive value? But firstly, how do we buy value? So we're actually baking in value day one. And how do we transform whatever we're buying into one thing and one thing only? And for me, it's not for everybody, but for me, it's secure long-term income for our investors, for ourselves. Uh, and we work with investors, plus we also teach other people how to do this. And it's really in a nutshell, what do we do? We force uh, capital appreciation, cash flow, by the law of least effort, by simple asset management techniques, as opposed to risky refurbs, risky conversions, and risky new builds. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but if you're just starting out in commercial, why take the massive risk? Why don't you start with something, and I call it buying income. You know, buy income day one, buy cash flow, uh, buy value and add value. It's, it's really sticking to the ABCs of commercial. Um, cool. Yeah. So, Dan, if people have questions, they can go to Taylor Capital, your website. Uh, what's the URL for that? Uh, it's taylorcapital.co.uk, and uh, cool. we're very exciting time because uh, next week we're releasing something that's quite exciting um so pop along there and you'll be notified or there's a youtube channel but uh, under dan taylor but taylorcapital.co.uk uh, you get a free workshop there it goes, it goes into nine case studies of our clients these are first time sometimes first time to commercial but there's two in there that have used SaaS that are first time to property and the, the gains we've made are pretty I don't know. They're not too shabby, shall we say. Very, very good. Um, if there are questions from the audience right now, use the Q&A button and type your question in. Dan will be here for another couple of minutes. I think David wants to now 
take over. So over to you, David. Brilliant. Thanks very much, John. And again, thank you very much, Dan. Really, really um, fascinating insight really into the world of commercial property. It's not something that I've ever really dealt much into 20 odd years in property investment. And uh, yeah, it's just not something I've ever looked into. So um, you, you had some angles there and some uh, um, wee sayings. I mean, I love that one again. What is it? The coffee and chat is better than construction and contracts. Contracts. <laughs> uh, I like that one. I like that one. Many a, many a contract was poured over and many a construction site was visited. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I think I prefer to be sitting in the cafe having a chat uh, than doing that. So, brilliant. We really appreciate that, Dan. Thanks very much. And so we are going to be doing a bit of business, um, hopefully, next wee while. Um, so you might have some case studies appearing on our platform quite soon. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to that. Fantastic. Thanks very much, guys. I'll leave you one, one, uh, one snippet, real-life story of a client. Um, it won't take long. It's uh, a, a it client. Be, it better not. <laughs> <laughs> Go a ahead. client who's buying this property from auction. Sorry, John. Oh, Dad, I, Dad, I need to stop you because we do have a question, and I think it's a question for you. So uh, Gordon says that he's new to commercial. Um, he wants to know um, what creative strategies you can use with commercial that you can't use with residential. And in like 10 words or less, what's the key to that? The key to uh, strategies in commercial is providing creative solutions to problems where you create a win-win solution, a holistic solution that uh, increases value massively while providing solution to the other person. And it's, any, and it's really where I come from is a fusion of business buying tactics and creative commercial property strategies together to really accelerate values. We've got one strategy called Bimble. So, uh, so hang on a second. So I think because that sounds to the residential people like, well, that's what we do. I think what really is different though is you're mostly doing this on the lease contract side. That's how you're uplifting value. You're not actually changing the building half as much as you're changing the income stream. Is that fair? 100% yes. But that story just dovetails in with that nicely, John. So 30 seconds on this story, a client buying a property auction in January. Uh, <laughs> and uh, it was great, 300,000 pounds, shops and uppers, just like an hour outside of London. So who said this can't be done outside of London? He's in the auction room and in the auction room, everybody stops because they don't know one piece of information that we found out. And why did we find that out? Because coffee and chats. What did we do? We went to see the tenant three times. The tenant was leaving the 18 month left on the lease, which is why the vendor was selling, panicking, distressed, motivated vendor. Uh, we knew before we went to that auction room, we had a 10 year lease signed. That increased the value by 87 and a half thousand. We knew that before we went to the auction room. Nobody else knew that. Mm. So we knew we could increase the value by 87 and a half thousand pounds by paperwork and coffees, coffees and chats, just because we put boots on our ground and went behind any lines and start speaking to people. That's it in a nutshell. Excellent, excellent. No, great, great story. So again, um, thanks very much, Dan. No doubt we'll have you back on again in a few weeks' time when we're talking about doing even a, um, a webinar some, some evening, uh, maybe next month, and do a real deep dive into some of those uh, stories you've told. So again, thanks very much. Okay, uh, moving on then. And uh, to wrap up, we have, well, I guess an important um, uh, state of mind to have in the current climate. Keep educating yourself. Uh, and that's very much what this next um, sort of wrap-up section is about. Uh, so Leo Prop Crowd, our property crowdfunding platform, and Property Fortress, which is uh, John's uh, company, uh, we are working together on a series of educational models. Uh, and this is very much about providing that education for people who want to learn some new, not so much new skills, more information, different angles within the world of property, um, or it might just be sharpening their axe. They might know a little bit about some of the topics, but they maybe haven't thought about them much recently. Um, so this is a series of modules uh, that will really bring people up to speed. Uh, and as I say, very much sharpen the axe. So you can see the topics uh, on the modules. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, but uh, John, this is designed to be interactive. It's designed to provide value. Uh, what would your uh, comments be as to the value we can um, add to people who take these modules. You're still on mute, I think, at the minute. 
it's holding the space bar, but it didn't work at that time, sorry. Um, the pricing set up to encourage people to interact. The, the, it's probably gonna be a small number of people, so you'll have a lot of uh, time to ask your own questions. But we wanna take people through the journey that these modules represent, which is essentially transforming people who are used to going to the bank, getting a standard loan and coming up with cash deposits uh, to people who can now raise money at will from the wider audience, uh, real equity, real cash to match the debt that you could probably get from a bank. And if the banks aren't lending, you just raise a bit more cash. Mm -hmm. And you have four steps. There's the whole compliance side of working with other investors. There's how to structure the deals correctly so the other investors would actually be interested. It's not quite as simple as doing it for yourself. Moving on to the module three, it's more about how to reach out and build your investor list and outsourcing the heavy lifting to a platform. And module four is actually about making sure you're on top of your DD because the investors are gonna evaluate your deals a certain way. You need to get under their skin and understand how they do that. Yeah, no, very, very much so. And uh, yeah, these will be live modules. Uh, however, they will be recorded. So um, in the future, people can just purchase the recording if they, if they so wish. Um, but certainly I'm looking forward to this. Uh, we'll uh, have this out uh, probably in about two weeks' time. We'll put the dates out. Uh, but we're working on uh, really making sure we've got some, some really good value. So um, I'm looking forward to delivering these. Just to, hold, just to hold your feet to the fire, we're actually looking at the second, the Tuesday in May. I think it's May 5th is the first Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about, uh, that is when we believe we'll be able to start. We do have to get the presentation materials signed off by compliance. That's a little bit of a bottleneck right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, again, I'll show you a link, um, in, in a second, um, as to, as to that, uh, just checking the questions, uh, when will these modules start? I've signed up for one and yes. Okay. So you'll, um, be receiving a confirmation of the actual dates. As John said, we've more or less settled on those. So we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, you'll get that email from us, which is fantastic. So um, next bit of sort of this working together between myself and John. Um, so a lot of people um, contact John directly and also people contact me directly, reference consultancy. Um, and very often to provide a holistic consultancy package, um, I might want to bring in John from my clients and vice versa. So we've literally just put this package together, which means you get both myself and John for four hours of live Zoom sessions. And that also includes four hours on our part um, in terms of deliverables. It might be preparation for the next session. It might be taking information you've given us and, and us have to analyze that to, to then give you some input and a steer. And uh, we deliver that, as I say, over four hours of live um, Zoom sessions. So the value in this is listed down the side. Uh, and really, John, it's whatever the clients feel they need us to help them with. That's probably the, as broad as it can be. And then we can narrow it down and, and zoom into whatever particular aspect. Um, I'll just mention one last thing before I let John wrap up the slide. The black book of contacts, I think, is in itself um, very valuable. And we always come across people who need help with some specific aspect of their deal, particularly a deal that's gone wrong. Uh, and very often we can put them in touch with someone uh, that can help them in the situation they're in. Um, and that's always um, nice to be able to do that and actually help people with their projects. But uh, again, John, in terms of value, um, what, what are people going to get um, by engaging with us in this consultancy package? So it's very much tailored to the individual, as you said. So it could be more strategic or it could be more tactical. Um, there's definitely people who are having a major rethink right now. Uh, we've had some people that we've been talking to either together or individually who suddenly have a problem with funding um, because they've had some wobble happen in their existing projects. And then in a couple other cases, it's got nothing to do with any short-term wobbles, but they've had finally the time to think about what their bigger picture is and they need some guidance how to take things to the next level. That they've been successful, uh, maybe a hundred unit portfolio, and they want to know how to go to the next level from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very much so. So um, again, more than happy to uh, have a, a brief chat with people just for the 15, 20 minutes, sort of free of charge. If you want to ask any specific questions about the consultancy or establish exactly what we can help you with, or you let us know where your pain points are, we'll, we'll know the value we can bring. Um, certainly debt is not as easy as it was uh, a few months ago uh, and equity is probably harder. 
uh, as people are waiting to see what happens. So um, if we can help provide you a solution uh, that provides you funds for your project, uh, well, then that's going to be um, a, a win-win. Uh, so uh, that is really the end of the webinar. There is the contact details. So if you do want to book a training module, then there is the link uh, that you can um, take down and, and click on. Uh, then there's my contact details. You can contact me direct, or if you know John or get John through LinkedIn, that's fine. You can contact him directly and uh, we will be able to engage with you. So again, thank you for your time today. Again, it's been very useful getting a market update. Um, I'm going to try a couple of hot cups of hot water, see if this works, John, rather than having tea and biscuits. Um, but you, definitely, you definitely can put a slice of, slice of lemon or lime in if you need to shift the flavor of orange even. Uh, it's, it's hard but to, more it, important, it, it, thank you, Dan. Yeah, I was about to say, so Dan is, is again for your time, superb. Appreciate that. And uh, we look forward to seeing everyone again next week on our weekly webinar, The Lowdown in the Lockdown. So all the best, guys, and stay safe. Thanks, guys. Bye.